doer is our next speaker, Eric Sorensen, who had the very difficult job of taking over after Reg had left. Over to Eric. Um, th thank you very much, David. And in my um, five minutes, which, which David has allotted to me, uh, uh, oh, sorry, three. <laughs> uh, I will try and keep my. But there's, there's one, or, one or two introductory things. I'd just like to say how nice it is both to see all of you, but also particularly uh, two of our ministers who looked after us, Kenneth Baker and Tom King, without whose support this place would never have happened because the government is absolutely crucial. Uh, Chairman uh, Chris Benson, uh, Michael Pickard, Jane Pickard. Board members Penny Cobham uh, and Connor McCauley, and no doubt there are others uh, who I've uh, forgotten or not met, but anyway, uh, welcome to those in particular who looked after us, and by golly, did we need looking after. Um, I, I just wanted to build on, on a remark that uh, towards the end that uh, uh, Michael Estine made about um, uh, the perversity of, of this place. Uh, there are many, many versions of the truth about Docklands, which I discovered uh, at a seminar I went to uh, last week, which is a bit fractious about what lessons we might learn, and I learned there were many versions of that truth. Um, but I think one of the truths is, is perversity, uh, and a couple of examples would be the way in which uh, Reg in particular, uh, when you said to him, I don't think that's a very good idea, he would come back and report they think it's a terrific idea. <laughs> and when they said to him, there's no money, he would come back and say, it's been funded. <laughs> and it was that kind of manic, uh, perverse uh, drive which made him such a, a great man and such a great leader of, of, of this project. Uh, the other perverse example uh, I should also give you is that when Docklands was formally set up uh, through the... Um, the legislation in, I think, 1981, it finally happened, uh, the government at the same time cancelled the then version of the Jubilee Line, uh, and also the GLC cancelled the then version of whatever it was, the Northern Relief Route, the Southern Relief Route, which was going to link Docklands uh, to the rest of London. So the project, of course, started with its full and unbridled support. And Reg knew this. Reg knew that in order to get anything done, uh, you had to lie. Um, <laughs> you certainly had to slightly deceive, if lying is a bit strong, and you had to display the tremendous uh, energy that, that he did. The, uh, he walked round this place, and of course it's impossible to imagine this now. It's just deserted Docklands of, of massive disinvestment, population loss as it was in the late 70s and early 1980s. And one of Reggie's particular skills was to find attributes, the docks, some people wanted to fill them in, he thought they were of value, the river side, the river walkway, the importance of water side. And also he discovered as he walked round uh, the old viaducts of the Blackwall and, and Docklands Poplar Railway. And this was going to be knocked down by the various highway schemes. And he said, no, 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 we're going to put on a light railway. And it was very much his own idea to drive this forward. I mean, light rails, there's plenty of precedence for them around the world. But he was the one who could see that it would offer practicality, link into the city at Tower Gateway. It would be relatively cheap because it'd have existing train pathways and it would be visible. He was, Reg was a great marketeer. He could see the importance of actually making this place visible because, as Michael Heseltine said, one of the other perversities of this place was it wasn't built by the Brits. Certainly the commercial stuff, which are notable exceptions we'll hear about shortly, was built by uh, international capital who could see uh, the vision in a way that he could not. It was part of Reg's very important contribution uh, that he was able to convey this visibility. He also had this manic idea that we ought to have uh, a short takeoff uh, and landing airport, Stolport. And so he had arranged a dinner with Philip Beck, then of Molums, 
who was uh, looking for investment opportunities and did have indeed the kind of ambition we wanted. And with Bill Bryce, I think it was, of Bryman Airways, together with the airline, uh, the investor and developer, and Docklands as a, as, as, as a fosterer, we got what is now London City Airport underway. And that was very much a personal vision of, of Regis. And the third one, slightly more mundane, but the Enterprise Zone, he decided he wanted to make the Enterprise Zone uh, visible and give it some kind of identity. So he said, we won't just put tarmac, we'll have our version of the yellow brick road, which were the red brick roads, as you will uh, remember. Now all pulled up, of course, because they don't meet health and safety and all the other 95 things you've got to meet nowadays. But those were the kind of energy, insight, marketing, dynamism which Reg brought to this project. And he was a fantastic leader just at the stage when it needed to get going. Thanks very much, David. You say